in Freudian terms, it's good to have healthy ego strength. And that, to be a well-adjusted, normal human being, you need to have good ego strength. Well, the more you start to realize that there is no such thing as a well-adjusted human being, because the human being is, is a construct, just like in the Matrix, Neo was a human being. And Morpheus was his teacher that believed that he was the one. Not the one in terms of being a person who's the one, like a messiah or something, but I mean the one, the, the divine one, the one that we all are. And so that's why we'll show some clips today that, that are really about clearing that away, but as long as you become more and more intuitive and more and more guided and connected with the Holy Spirit or the Higher Self, then, then you can expect that those boundaries will loosen and that it will be perfectly fine. Because I realize right now there's a part of me that's like, well, if I really do that, people think I'm crazy. If I'm just really open and all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Judgment. There's judgment. Ego's judging and keeping you there. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. There's a, an idea that if you follow this out all the way, that the condemnation of the world will rest upon you, will rest upon your shoulders. And I had to deal with that as I was going through this transformation, I was thinking, what will people think? Um, how will people treat me? Uh, where will I end up? You know, how will I just be in, end up like in the streets somewhere or off in the woods in the forest because nobody can relate to me anymore? And those are typical doubt thoughts and fears as you start to go through the transformation because the ego doesn't know where you're heading. Uh, it can't know where you're heading. It doesn't know the spirit. It was made as a denial of the spirit. But what I found is it's really beautiful. Like, that was my big concern with relationships was, I thought, oh, this is radical. The deeper I go with this, the, the pool of potential relationships is going to shrink and shrink and get down more and more narrow. So I thought, I'm. That's not a good goal. I, I want a sense of intimacy and, and the pool of potential relationships would shrink. And yet, it's, it's the other way around. When you, when you open up to a sense of not having these judgments and opinions, without having agendas, you know, and having control, then you, that vibration brings forth witnesses of that vibration. It's like attracts like. It's not opposites attract at all, it's, that's kind of more the ego's uh, version of attraction. It's more like attracts like, and that you do see witnesses of that state of mind. Lots of them. I mean, I see lots of them all over the world. And I, but I never believed it would go that way. I, I was always fearful, thinking I would be like living in a cave somewhere and not being able to speak, because nobody would understand the words, and it's not been that way at all. That was fear and then ego. Yeah. Trying to put you in some sort of victim. Yeah, yeah. And projecting it to the future. Like, if this keeps continuing, this is going to be bad news. But it hasn't. It's been... Absolutely the opposite. Yeah, exactly. Okay, we're going to start off with a, with a real basic clip. Um, in A Course of Miracles, Jesus has a little saying where he says, when you meet anyone, remember it is a holy encounter. As you see him, you will see yourself. As you treat him, you will treat yourself. As you think of him, you will think of yourself. Never forget this, for in him you will find yourself or lose yourself. So if you think about all the human interactions that we have on planet Earth, we have so many opportunities. We all know the value of meditation. I mean, we've all seen the value of stilling our mind and quieting our mind when we can. But these holy encounters give us like, many opportunities to really kind of clear our mind of all kinds of judgments and grievances. It's very much like the Hawaiian practice of Ho'oponopono, just emptying your mind, taking 100% responsibility for your state of mind, and just emptying or cleaning and clearing away anything else. So the first clip I'm going to show you this afternoon is from a movie called Waking Life, and it's actually a, an animated movie where they actually film the movie and then they use an animation process to turn the film into an animation. 
And this is going to be just two people who, who are meeting on a staircase. And you just recognize the simplicity of this encounter and the willingness of the, the, the girl in the clip. She just has this simple openness. She just wants to connect and it just comes through. It's a very simple clip, but it really gives you that sense of this opportunity that's available with all of our interactions. basically for survival, all communication, simply to keep this ant colony buzzing along in an efficient, polite manner. Here's your change. Paper or plastic? Credit or debit? You want ketchup with that? I don't want a straw. I want real human moments. I want to see you. I want you to see me. I don't want to give that up. I don't want to be an ant, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I don't want to be an ant either. <laughs> yeah, thanks for kind of like jostling me there. I've been kind of on zombie autopilot lately. I don't feel like an ant in my head, but I guess I probably look like one. It's kind of like D.H. Lawrence had this idea of two people leaning on a road, and instead of just uh, passing and glancing away, they decide to accept what he calls the confrontation between their souls. It's like... Um, like freeing the brave, reckless gods within us all. Then it's like we have met. <laughs> That's the attitude, just that little bit of openness, you know, to just go beyond the mundane, the condition, just to open up. Now the next clip I'm going to show you is from the same movie, and um, this one's called Time and Yes to God, and I'm just going to, I'll get Click on the clip here and fast forward just a little bit. The reason he had written this book okay. was that... Okay. And it's like, you know, uncanny. You know, even the characters' names are the same as in the Bible. And the Book of Acts takes place in 50 AD, when it was written, supposedly. So Philip K. Dick had this theory that time was an illusion, and that we were all actually in 50 AD. And the reason he had written this book was that he had somehow momentarily punctured through this illusion, this veil of time, and what he had seen there was what was going on in the Book of Acts. And he was really into uh, Gnosticism, and this idea that this demiurge or demon had created this illusion of time to make us forget you know, that Christ was about to return, and the kingdom of God was about to arrive. And that we're all in 50 AD, and there's someone trying to make us forget, you know, that, you know, God is imminent. And that's what time is. That's what all of history is. It's just kind of this continuous, um, you know, daydream or distraction. And so I read that, and I was like, well, that's weird. And then that night, I had a dream, and there was this guy in the dream who was supposed to be a psychic. But I was skeptical. I was like, yeah, he's not really a psychic, and I'm just thinking to myself. And then suddenly, I start floating, like levitating, up to the ceiling. And as I almost go through the roof, I'm like, Okay, Mr. Psychic, I, I believe you. You're a psychic. Put me down, please. And then I float down, and as my feet touch the ground, the psychic turns into this woman in a green dress. And this woman is Lady Gregory. Now, Lady Gregory was Yeats's patron, this you know, Irish person. And though I'd, I'd never seen her image, I was just sure that this was the face of Lady Gregory. So we're walking along, Lady Gregory turns to me and says, let me explain to you the nature of the universe. Now Philip K. Dick is right about time, but he's wrong that it's 50 AD. Actually, there's only one instant, and it's right now, and it's eternity. And it's an instant in which God is posing a question. And that question is basically, do you want to, you know, 
be one with eternity? Do you want to be in heaven? And we're all saying, no, thank you. Not just yet. And so time is actually just this constant saying no to God's invitation. I mean, that's what time is. I mean, and it's no more 50 AD than it's 2001. You know, I mean, there's just this one instant, and that's what we're always in. And then she tells me that actually this is the narrative of everyone's life. That, you know, behind the phenomenal difference, there is but one story. And that's the story of moving from the no to the yes. All of life is like, no thank you, no thank you, no thank you. And ultimately it's, yes, I give in. Yes, I accept. Yes, I embrace. I mean, that's the journey. I mean, everyone gets to the yes in the end, right? Right. <laughs> That's a nice little clip that kind of puts it down in very succinct terms. Learning to say the big yes, the yes of embrace, the yes of allowance, the yes of acceptance. And, and it just seems like this ego, this thing that seems so ingenious, has been able to invent like layers and layers and layers of complexity to obscure the simple yes. And that all of these layers of complexity are based in, in linear time. Because linear time conflicts with eternity. Not in reality, but in terms of awareness. It's almost like, uh, like you know, you want to tune into a radio station and, and, you know, it's like that old song that Steely Dan did, I think. Uh, no static at all, FM. No static at all, FM. You know, getting that perfect, clear channel is what the goal of spirituality is, just to tune in so the static is all gone. You just hear the clarity just pouring through, that music just pouring through, and the ego has just seemed to invent linear time as a way to make static, you know, to obscure that clear, clear channel. So, as you go deeper into the mind, and that, at lunchtime we were examining some of these questions too, that the more you go inward, the more that the intuitive guide, the spirit within you, will dissolve away the time concepts. You know, including the idea that it takes time to return to God. I mean, the first time I read that, I was reading in Course in Miracles, and Jesus said, the ego likes the idea of return to God. And I thought, oh, no, it must be a misprint. <laughs> he couldn't like that, the ego couldn't like that one. But he says, because the ego can make the idea seem extremely difficult. So, that's why we were saying it's a journey without distance to a goal that has never changed. That just the very idea of return to God, the ego will play with that idea try to make it a difficult journey. Hard, struggle, you know, throw up all kinds of uh, obstacles. And there's another part of the Course, you know, we've heard the saying from the Bible, the Kingdom of Heaven is within you. Jesus says the word within is actually unnecessary. The Kingdom of Heaven is you. It, you are created as Heaven. And when we think about heaven and earth, uh, even ideas like bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth, he's just saying that you need to open your mind to a state where heaven and earth are not separate states. You know, where your earth experience becomes literally a reflection of heaven. A unified experience where everything is welcome. Everyone, everything is welcome in your vision, in your perception. The state of all-inclusiveness with mind, where you don't reject anything. You don't say, you know, I, I'm glad I'm not like that, you know, and point the finger at something. I always said, you know, you have a finger pointing at somebody, you've got three fingers pointing right back at you. One for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Ghost, since we're at Easter time. <laughs> you got the Trinity going, mm-hmm, what are you pointing at? To see that there's really nothing that you can reject from your awareness. That literally your mind is all encompassing. And that's the goal of spirituality, is to let that integration occur so that you can accept your 
your wholeness, your completeness.